I want to thank you all for coming and to, to Roger and his colleagues and to Wyatt uh, for organizing uh, this, this conference um, under the aegis of the RN Center. So I, I want to say that uh, I will uh, be brief and uh, make a, a few points uh, from the perspective of a practitioner. Uh, education and its political consequences um, or its place in uh, society is not a subject about which I know anything um, beyond the experience of having to, to work in it. Uh, so I am to education uh, what a um, uh, a combat officer is, as opposed to someone who went to West Point, who studied the art of war. I just have fought it, and uh, what I know is completely um, from that point of view. Second, I want to take the occasion of um, the aegis of this and the opening quote by Hannah Arendt to point out that um, it is interesting to think about what she thought about education given what her understanding of her own education was. I, am, I actually do not share, although I'm actually the volume that Wyatt Mason quoted from was a volume I think Richard Rodriguez has an essay in as well. So I come from a completely different point of view. I have a tremendous fear of the confusion of the private narrative as the basis to talk about education. I am, think that is in fact one of the primary dangers, the ease with which we put I as the beginning premise of the way we talk about a collective institution and experience that is education. Most people have ideas about education which are from an internal conversation about their own experience. So it would be as if we would define medicine from the totally inaccurate and self-serving accounts of having been a patient. Uh, and my own view is that um, the private doesn't become the public. It's not a basis by which to argue or to define what we are doing in education. In education, it seems to me we are learning to subordinate the private point of view in order to forge a basis of conversation, of language, uh, with others who are different, with whom we can be empathetic, um, without having to personalize it, without having to find a linkage between our personal experience and the legitimacy of what is said. Um, that we are trying to create a public, a basis for a public conversation about the shared space which we inhabit, which is we you find it the world, whether it is the society, the political structures, the, the smaller communities. How do we live side by side, not as lone individuals, but as citizens? And how do we do that, uh, even if we view citizenship as an unfortunate necessity, uh, but a, a, fact of, a, a fact of life that can't be eliminated? It's interesting that Hannah Arendt's generation of European emigres that came to the United States and developed a love affair with things American. Among the things they liked was the fact that the American school system was not, by any reasonable comparison, authoritarian. That from the early kindergarten, the American progressives believed the child should be permitted to express him or herself. Now, this may not actually happen in the classroom, please. I'm not talking about what kids actually experience in a kindergarten, but the way the, the teacher training schools argued in the progressive era about what was called the child-centered curriculum where the idea that the child who knew nothing and could do nothing was entitled to express him or herself. The notion that getting along with one another was an important 
output, if you will, of education, that the definition of what a good education was was not purely cognitive, was not information, but actually learning how to be a citizen because the country was, by its very self-assertion, diverse. Now, clearly, she saw this at a time where there was a lot of hypocrisy about that diversity. We are far more diverse now than we were then, although it's, you know, if you act, ask the 19th century Irish uh, Catholics whether the Italian Catholic living in a different neighborhood was the same person, they would have been horrified. Uh, now they're just white uh, and uh, just Catholic. We've eroded the things that people killed each other over um, as differences. So the ethnic differences of the late 19th century and the mid 20th century seem pale to us now, but in red they were not pale to the people who actually lived by them. Um, so even in the midst of segregation and of institutionalized racism uh, in the 50s, uh, America looked diverse by a European point of view and tolerant. The other thing that was crucial was that um, there was a premium on the independence of thought of the child as a child grew older. So when, when it came to the university system, which was shocking to a European, the American university system seemed immensely flexible and open. There was not one single professor running a department. People did not wait for that person to die. The university was able to create new fields, new positions. There was not a hierarchy of deference to authority. A graduate student who walked in to a professor's lab and said, you are wrong, got a job. <laughs> that was an incredible um, contrast to um, the European experience. But most important was the idea of a single unitary school system in which everybody went to school to the end of secondary school. The European system from which Arendt came was segregated at age 11 into varying categories and most people never completed school at all, except for elementary school, rudimentary, rudimentary elementary school. So a very small percentage of the population went to a high school or secondary school diploma which permitted them to go to a university. What these emigres discovered was, unlike John Dewey, they saw from the outside that there was something extremely important about the way we educate and structure our schools and our capacity to maintain a democracy. For Dewey, it was a, there was a different route to that, but for the emigre, the contrast between the school system from which they came and the school system of the country they arrived at was closely connected to the differences in way citizenship was obtained. Citizenship was impossible to be obtained by an adult through a process, um, irrespective of birth or ethnicity or language, um, but it was possible in this country. So the public school, uh, the unitary public school that did not segregate by ability or career path or vocational uh, reasons was viewed uh, by this emigrate generation as a, as a, a wonderment. So they, um, they believe there was an inherent relationship between the school system and the possibility of democracy. That was the good news. The bad news was that the standards by which this school operated seemed horrifically low. Though so they recognized immediately the price paid for the democracy of the school system and its output. So the inherent snobbery of this European generation teaching American college students uh, simply exploded without any kind of self-control. Um, freshmen, what they used to be called first year students, from their sense couldn't read or write, had no understanding of literature and history, uh, were completely disoriented, could do nothing. And um, they were bemused by the, um, this is in the humanities and social sciences, not in the sciences so much. So just for a context, this conference takes place 
in an institution where Hannah Arendt's husband was hired in 1951 to correct this failing. A man who himself had never completed school was hired by the then president, James Case, to put in something called the Common Course, which we now experience as the first year seminar, in order to correct in a minor way the failings of the progressive, student-centered, self-expressive tradition of progressive education. People were confident, they were Ex they expressed themselves very well, but they were empty. They had nothing to say. They simply were simply tied down by ignorance and, from their point of view, uh, vulgarity. Um, and so there was a need to introduce them to the traditions of learning, uh, which seemed to have disappeared from the curriculum of the school. And it's interesting that there's always this back to basics movement where people want to define what people ought to know and learn when they are in school. Um, and that the absence of any kind of understanding uh, in their view or knowledge was a result of a progressive emphasis on um, distinction between content and method. So that people were taught how to think, but they knew nothing. So what could they think about? Uh, they were taught how to express, but there was no, there was no, there seemed to be no content from their point of view. Remember also that after the war, the Second World War, German intellectuals, Hammermans and others, did believe that the reform of the German educational system and university system was crucial to creating a democracy. So this link was in this generation's mind as a very strong one. But their perspective is not entirely relevant to the situation we now face um, 60, 70 years later. First of all, in their lifetime, until 1970, really till the election of Ronald Reagan, nobody ever took seriously the dismantling of the public school system. One of the consequences of the Brown versus Board of Education decision is the creation of the charter school movement and the popularization and legit legitimization of the idea that the American public school system should be privatized. We are living in the throes of an anti-government movement which is 40 years old and started with a long-weighted attack on the requirement that children go to public school. The motivations were racist, whites not wanting to have their children attend schools which blacks attended, and then papered over by religious liberty, that they didn't want their children to go to a school that had godlessness at its core. They wanted to circumvent the separation of church and state. The end result is that we have now made privatization a major objective of school reform in this country. And it is endorsed ironically by the first African American president of the United States. Now, this is a bizarre turn of events. The nice way of looking at it is saying, well, privatization is a way we can actually confront the failings of the public schools, which is the title of our conference. So my point of view of this is that I will agree that the American schools are not good, but they were never good. <laughs> From the point of view of the European standard of a high standard of education, the American schools never really competed. But that was not their purpose. Their purpose was the creation of a common national community out of diverse groups. As the diverse groups got more diverse, people got uncomfortable with this. And um, was it successful in creating a, a democratic culture? I'm not so sure. I'm not an American historian. It's not anything I know about. But it's quite clear that um, the standards of the American schools haven't fallen. If you consider that it's only until after the Second World War that more than 50% of 18-year-olds in the United States finished high school. Before then, only a minority finished high school. 
So the project of attempting to educate 75%, 80%, perhaps 100% of all Americans in a single school system was never really tried until the 1960s. And when that was really tried in the 1960s, it began to fall apart. So if you're going to make the schools really democratic, it's extremely hard. One of the uncomfortable truths is that our equality of citizenship doesn't run parallel with our equality to do a variety of things. Jump high, run fast, sing, and learn. A person who cannot learn as well as another person should not be disadvantaged as a citizen and as a participant in democracy. That equality is at the core of the nation. But it's very hard to reconcile differentials in education with one person, one vote. In that conundrum, um, it rests part of the criticism of the American schools. My view is the schools fail not because they can't change the distribution of population by any scale of, of capacity, but that the standards of that distribution are too low. That is to say, we fail the least advantaged people, and we also fail those with talent. We fail everyone. The average sits on too low a standard of achievement. But this is inherent in the attempt to do a democratic system. No nation has ever attempted this kind of uniform, single school, democratic school system. Privatization is now popular because people are saying we shouldn't do it. It's a bad idea. And not only that, government can't do anything. And government is notoriously terrible, something I don't believe. And that it can't be fixed. So it's better to do it in the private sector. I have to think that the privatization of American education is a blow at the very possibilities of democracy. And the fact is that there's so little opposition to it is frightening to me. And that it is so much the beloved charity of all of the 1% against whom Occupy Wall Street tried to protest. Every hedge fund owner, what they love is the privatization of the American school. That's why union bashing is so popular, attacking teachers. But who are our teachers? Who goes into teaching? Who has actually tried to do something to change the quality of who takes public teaching, school teaching, in the public schools as a career? So the crisis we face is twofold. Number one, do we still believe in the idea that American democracy requires a single school system that is in the hands of the public instruments of government and not in the hands of private business or private ownership? Even in the state of New York, a private institution, Bard being a good example, is regulated by the state. And we are part of the university of the state of New York. I think that is a good thing, that the accreditation of private schools and public schools is shared and overlapping. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that we are discussing the failing of education at, at a time when the, the nation cannot forge a conversation about public goods in general. This is where I share the Arendtian distrust of private languages and the attempt to talk about one's personal narrative as a basis for talking about education. My personal narrative is irrelevant. What I have to learn in school is to set my personal narrative aside, to distinguish my personal narrative and my role as a citizen. They don't necessarily overlap. and to learn things that allow me to function in that democratic context. So if there's an election and there are issues about the election, can I find a basis to talk about those issues with someone whose personal narrative is radically different? Different ethnicity, different religion, different customs. But we share the same water system. 
we breathe the same air. We drive down the same highway. We require the same electricity. We're on the same internet, maybe on different sites. We have the same appetites. We, our foods are different. We share our beds with different types of humanity. But the same people are looking at us and tracking our cell phones. <laughs> so the personal narrative bleeds into a common circumstance. The interest rates or the absence of them that we have to pay for our mortgages are shared. There's illusion that I can hide from that public circumstance. So what do I need to know in order to make a conversation with those people who share those spaces? If you think public goods are relevant that we can do without government, is a kind of illusion that whose criticism is not possible because there is no discussion. The fact that the President and Congress are not in conversation not only has to do that with issues of race, the President would have been much better off were he white. There wouldn't be this kind of problem. Even if we were an African American woman, it would have been better too. But if the, the white men can tolerate a truly brilliant and competent and successful African American male. The ugliness of this is incredible. What's most incredible is the fact is that two people can sit in the same platform and talk about the ideas in a way that there's a give and take and some real flexibility. They can be socially friendly. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Anthony Scalia can go to the opera together. That's a private narrative. What good does it do us? None whatsoever. So the friendship among the court justices has no consequence in the nature which we negotiate the compromise and the exchanges in the public sphere. So if you don't believe in public goods, in, in, in restoring public education, then the question is, um, you know, how, if you don't believe that there is a, a public sphere that can operate, um, what's the school training the citizen to do? Just make money? Succeed in the marketplace? Work for Google? What's the new government? It's Google. It's not the Congress. You know the conspiracy theories that the wacky people when we were growing up used to do on the, on the street corners? They were socialists and communists and, they, and, and nothing they said was plausible. Except the paranoia. <laughs> that was completely plausible. But the, the people I'm scared of is not the US government. Are these very large corporate giants that control our access to information? Brings me to the, so privatization is problem number one. Number two is the connection between education and a larger conversation about public goods. And I think we have to reverse the privileging of a personal conversation. The use of the word I. My biography is irrelevant to training my capacity to be a citizen. Technology. Now, technology has had unusual consequences. It's not itself an independent force, in my view. But technology comes at a very interesting time because um, if you privilege the idea of a personal narrative, my point of view, which comes out of a crisis, intellectual crisis, in the 20th century about notions of objectivity and truth. People are, have sort of, in, in the culture, have assumed a notion that um, everyone is entitled to his or her own opinion, and there are very few things about which one can come to some conclusion agreement that it's true. That the truth, at best, is provisional, and in most things, purely subjective. This allows for people to believe things to be true that are not. And that modern technology allows them to dress it up with a community. 
that's virtual, that shares these distorted views. And not all views are equally distorted. So the crisis of objectivity in the general conversation of you know, how do you understand something? So there are five different think tanks that put five different reports, all with statistics nominally and all with an argument, and how you discern which of these is plausible or not. And then it comes from the ideological, and then it's ideological, it's simply personal, and no one has any desire to negotiate these two reports from, from the Heritage and from, from the Brookings Institution. All nominally on the same subject, low rates of literacy. So how, does, how do you negotiate that? In modern technology, there's no need to, because the segregation of sites and the segregation of people's communications um, doesn't overlap. The public space becoming virtual destroys the need to have a conversation in real time and real space with people who disagree. The second point of technology is the Wikipedia phenomenon. The Wikipedia phenomenon, when we used to have encyclopedias, which were useless, actually, even the Encyclopedia Britannica. Even in high school, and I went to a bad high school. I mean, perfectly all right, it was, it was uh, this is a parenthetical. I think one thing that Americans have to come to grips with is that schooling is not the same as education. The amount of time a person spends in school is trivial. We do that with child rearing. You have a problem child, you send it to an expert. You don't parent, you send them to a psychiatrist if you're upper middle class. If you're middle class, you maybe see a counselor. Otherwise, you blame something else or abandon the whole thing. We have a tendency to, div to get rid of our own responsibility. Education is very similar. Schools are not the source of education. They are a minor influence very minor influence. So in a 24-hour day, in a seven-day week of people's lives, the source of education is from a multiple sources. With technology, that multiplicity of sources has enlarged. The phenomenon of Wikipedia, for example, is interesting. In the old days, which of which I'm not nostalgic, the encyclopedia was an embarrassing beginning. So in high school, if you wrote a paper on Martin Luther King and you cited an encyclopedia article, you got a C. Because it didn't do much work and the encyclopedia article was considered only, you know, the first scene of the movie. Wikipedia and the internet and Google and the algorithms by which knowledge is placed on the internet have given people the illusion that that's all they need to know. And it has wiped out any respect for expertise below the level of Wikipedia. My favorite Wikipedia site is on St. Augustine. I like Wikipedia sites where a lot of crazy people are invested <laughs> in what's on the site. And St. Augustine has many constituents. He's got Catholics who are very ambivalent about him, very ambivalent about him. You have classicists who are interested in him. And you have Protestants who have dispute him. And he's very hard to figure out what he says. And then you have amateur fanatics and opponents who have never been heard from by anyone until the internet. <laughs> and this is a rapidly changing website. This Wikipedia people are killing each other and erasing and contesting and, um, and it's incomprehensible, completely incomprehensible. And it's very long, it's an extremely long, it's not an encyclopedia article, it's an ever-changing with various references. Um, and. Um, But it's only one example of how the internet has essentially eliminated the standards of real research and real expertise, leveled it. The idea was it would make everybody an expert. It has done exactly the opposite. 
it has made the real expert irrelevant. It has good things. So if you go to the doctor, the doctor, she tells you that you have X, Y, and Z allergy, you can spend several days reading about that allergy. Now what you understand from what you read is frightening because unless you have a very good education, you could get extremely misled by what's on there. So the, the mass of data plus this veneer of an easy access to some semblance of understanding has um, made the conversation about negotiating different points of view harder and not easier. It also has given a kind of intellectual respectability to a purely personal prejudice. I can now gather material, data, colleagues and experts to defend a point of view that may be, in the end, indefensible. So the question is, where does that bring us? So to close, I would say, as a practitioner, as a practitioner, I still hold to the idea that the most difficult thing to do is for us to construct a language of public conversation. And that language of public conversation will inevitably be different from private language. We cannot expect it to be the same. One of the most depressing things about American politics today is the extent to which our candidates think it is enough to be a personality and to talk their private language in order to get elected. Even the president got elected, not on ideas, but his personal story. Thank God Mr. Spitzer and Mr. Wiener's personal story was so terrible <laughs> that they didn't get elected. But they didn't get elected because the personal story was obnoxious. So we actually, the Clinton scandal is a good example of that. We are more interested in the personalities of our politicians as if they were just our private neighbors or friends than what they think. And they cannot talk a language, a comprehensible language of public conversation about the public goods. Education needs to create a, a community of very diverse people who retain their diversity, who are able to occupy a public space in which they can negotiate and discuss matters of shared concern, from foreign policy to domestic policy. The internet is not such a platform. The virtual space is not such a platform. Facebook is not such a platform. I happen to think that we need to forcibly and forcefully redouble the defense of a single system of public education to which our citizens have free access and that um, we need to resist the privatization movement. That does not mean that every school looks alike. Our Bard High Schools, which there are students here from, are very different from other schools, but they are public schools, they're not charter schools. And there's no reason that there cannot be diversity within a single public system. We, are, we will continue to be, I hope, an immigrant nation. And as an immigrant nation, we have an obligation to do that. If we want any hope of um, ameliorating this increasing differences in inequality of wealth and class distinctions based on wealth, um, a public school system is crucial. So, I would say that um, the very romantic uh, optimism that the emigre generation had uh, for the possibilities of a democratic school system that uh, could be of high quality and supportive of a successful democracy, that optimism is something I share and uh, it, um, it, I think, is worth fighting for. And there's lots of reasons to be optimistic. There are, uh, there's a lot of evidence, uh, it seems to me, that um, we can improve things. 
And the first step, I would say, would be um, to uh, generate a value system for um, current college students and the forthcoming generation of college students that actually public school teaching is a dignified, uh, honored career, more to be honored and celebrated than the choice of law, business, and medicine. Um, that's the one single thing I would hope that we would be able to do in the culture in order to um, improve the American school system and uh, try to um, lift from its, the image that it has in the country of, of, as this title says, of its failing fast. So these are my random thoughts. I do apologize. This is not, um, not what I normally think about, but um, uh, it's a, I happen to think that um, the Austrian satirist Karl Kraus um, was famous for saying that the co most coolest hoax, no, Elias Kennedy, not Krauss, Elias Kennedy said the most coolest hoax is the claim that language communicates. It's a complete hoax. There's something funny in that, it's also terribly true. I actually think that it is possible to create a shared language of conversation about um, the public space that we share as citizens and that uh, that is the objective of school. And one of the reasons why science is important, for example, and scientific understanding, uh, is that many of the public things we have to face, whether they be health, environment, are matters where understanding something about how the world works to the best of our ability is crucial. Understanding what is, what is, um, what is a mutation? What is um, genetic engineering? It's not what Hollywood tells you genetic engineering is. What does biotechnology really promise? How does a computer really work? Citizens need to know these kinds of things if they're going to retain their freedoms. It's a very simple proposition. That's part of that shared language. And the sooner we get down to business doing it, the better off we will be. The more we will have the space for our private languages. Thank you. Oh, sure, yeah. So we're going to open it up to questions in just one moment. I had a couple that came to me as I was, as I was listening, um, particularly at the end. This idea of an optimism about being able to create a shared public language makes me think about the kind of language that evolves in a friendship through time. As one knows someone longer, one begins to know what one friend, one's friend means when they say a certain thing. I've spoken to a couple who've been married for 57 years, and they say that one of the extraordinary things that happens after a long successful marriage is the creation of a shared private language. Um, when one is part of a community, if it is a religious community or if it is a town community, one knows that isn't uh, brought together by a religion. One knows that the, the center of town has certain things that have happened in it, and so it means something different to somebody who arrives there uh, as a foreigner versus somebody who has been there for some time. Through time, places and words begin to acquire specialized meanings to smaller communities. And it seems to me that conversation between people is contingent upon having an understanding of a shared language. How does, my, my question is, how if we are to maintain a shared language of conversation over something that isn't scientific and, and uh, fact-based, concrete, mathematical, but rather uh, poetical or uh, the humanities as we, as we celebrate here, 
how are we to assume that we can enlarge that conversation beyond a small group of people who through time come to understand each other because they're patient? Yeah. We aren't in the room with our culture. We aren't in the room with our citizens in that size. Can we be? Well, first of all, first of all, I mean, I, 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 I so disagree with the premises that um, that uh, so I, I, I want to be helpful here. Number one, um, yes, there is an easy out, which is to give up on democracy and look for an aristocracy. Um, and so long as I'm part of that aristocracy that's in charge, I'm perfectly happy. I am a natural autocrat, so uh, democracy seems, you know, democracy seems an impractical system anyway. So, um, but I think that's not a good solution. So that's number one. Number two, you know, um, Hollywood and advertising seem to do very well in communicating with people who have nothing in common to do the same thing. No, buying Nike shoes. I mean, there's a moronic thing to do. Uh, and the desire for products from diverse people, from poor people, from rich people. So we, somehow there's somebody out there really knows what he or she is doing uh, without having to have been married for 54 years. And they sell to complete strangers. Third, uh, have you been married for a long time and, and happily so? Uh, I don't think it has improved my linguistic skills. In fact, um, I, I, the, the more I know my partner, the less you know, I, less I have to talk. I think silence is the mark of a successful marriage. Um, so I, I, I don't. Um, so I don't, I don't get this. I just don't get the whole conversation. I don't think I have to, you know, and the whole point of America is precisely its friendliness to strangers. It's precisely that someone can come here and in no time whatsoever, you know, take her place as a citizen. So for that, I would say that I don't share the view that it takes a lot of time and, you know, you know to create a, a common language. I think the language about laws about politics, about rights, um, is, a, is a language. And it's a language that um, where there can be some agreement to understand how we, miss, we disagree about how we construe those rights. Is it my right to do X? Is a corporation an individual? I don't be a lawyer, right? Say Citizens United. Is a corporation an individual? That's a conversation I can have with a perfect stranger. I can have a come with a perfect stranger who is a devout Christian about if you believe that abortion is killing, what are the proper legal organizations to how do you actually um, negotiate the idea that allowing people to have abortions is not comparable to allowing people to kill children. I think it's a very long conversation. I don't need to know that person, but there must be a way that conversation can be had. And I do think that um, training that conversation, I think, for example, small things, public speaking, seems to be every school should have a tremendous amount of effort in public speaking. Um, that's why I believe in the notion of core texts, where everybody from a different point of view reads the same text and comes to different interpretations, but there's still a text that they can agree to discuss. Um, so I... Um, I don't really, I don't share this notion uh, that it's so difficult as you make it to be. Uh, I'm going to try again. <laughs> Good for I, you. There, there's a paradox at the heart of what you're saying, which I, I would Which imagine is deliberate, which is that on the one hand you suggest that, and we would all agree with you, the public conversation in America is not particularly sophisticated or uh, particularly adept at negotiating these various things that you say that we can do. Um, but the reason is not because the public can't do it. The reason is that people don't want the public to do it. The people who run the office don't want to do it, and they therefore and they're not willing to put the time in. So, for example, I don't actually think that um, there's a politician around today um, who is truly candid with the constituents 
and doesn't so craft the words because there is a kind of alliance between the public and the press um, to want to keep it very simple. I agree with you, there's a problem in the patience of the public to hear through a complicated argument that, um, that the amount of, um, the, the advantage of politicians to hide behind set slogans and rhetoric is so great. Yes, there is a real problem with our public, the problem of democracy, that they're willing to vote for a candidate without knowing anything what the candidate stands for, without even understanding the issues. Purely on personal, you know, Christine Quinn won or lost, not because she thought this or she was a good politician, she had good ideas, but some people didn't like that she was a lesbian. Some people think she didn't look good. And people worried about how Hillary Clinton looks. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. But that's, that is also why I don't have a particular regard for the press. But, um, so is it easier for us to take the easy way? Yes, but that's where leadership comes in. And that's where, um, uh, you know, there was a tremendous optimism uh, when the president gave that long talk while he was a candidate on race. Remember that? And that was a glimmer of hope. Here was a very differentiated conversation about race. And I think the nation can do it because we live it. We can have a differentiated conversation about the environment because we live it. The only differentiate about religion, thing, and we can actually talk about it. And uh, there is a failure. The elites have been have made so much money, they've done so well by essentially pacifying. I think Facebook actually is a kind of narcotic. Social networking is a narcotic to persuade people that their happiness, that they're happy without having to participate as citizens in the public sphere. That's why they're happy. No one's in. Why go vote? It's not important. We have sold the public that politics is irrelevant and is an outdated and unnecessary thing. Somebody gains from this. We don't, but somebody does. So I think it's possible to do. It really has been tried. I think that a candidate that really told the truth and was really revelatory and transparent in the real sense uh, would win hands down. <laughs> Frankly. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know anything about him, but I would have to say that there's a little bit of that in de Blasio's victory. There's a little bit of that. You know, he's willing to talk about taboo issues. He was a little bit, you know, and um, yes, you know, and people were offended that he, you know, trotted out, you know, the fact that a biracial marriage, uh, you know, it's, it, it's more admirable than uh, Bill Clinton's private life. So... If private life is going to be on the table, I'll take Bill de Blasio's, you know, uh, as opposed to somebody else's. But my, that's not the point. The point is that he actually, he, he talked, there was something better. So I think it can be done. I think it can be done. Before we open it up, as we uh, welcome members of BSEC who've arrived, I believe, from... Uh, Someone not from, from Newark. Ne yes. Which from Newark? Queens. Queens. Welcome. Queens. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, Let me say why, let me say why, I, I, you know, the, the possibilities of public education. These young people who are from BSEC, from the three BSECs, are a tribute to the fact that public education can actually work. And yesterday, we, uh, our closing speaker was uh, Saif Legal, who's been uh, a major innovator in New York public education since 1974, and who has put into practice this notion of, of improvement, and he believes that systemic change comes from one school and then another school and then another school. The question I guess for me is as much as I do agree with you that if someone spoke uh, the truth and was able to uh, be frank and candid with the American people, um, we would have a more elevated conversation because we wouldn't be sold a bunch of rhetoric that is designed to sell personality or, or keep people in a, in a certain point of view. Sam Tannenhaus, uh, who was on the stage another year, mm -hmm. former editor of the New York Times Book Review and a noted conservative author. I said the same thing to him a few years ago that, you know, 
taking your view, um, if there were just a candidate who could speak mm. honestly, persuasively, <clears throat> then uh, and candidly, we would have the ability to have a more elevated conversation. The leadership said, is what is lacking. And what he said? He said that is based on the false premise that we are all educated enough to actually be part of that conversation. Okay, so my, my response uh, a bit to that idea, because I wasn't there, is I worry about something before. I'm not sure that's right. I, I, didn't, I think what worries me is very, the reason slogans work, the reason advertising works, is because actually people don't want to be bothered. People don't want to change their point of view. Um, and it's, that's not about education. That's about, you know, in the Declaration of Independence, there's a phrase someplace, Roger probably knows this, about speaking to a candid world. What's that phrase? Um, there's a very interesting, eloquent phrase. And, yeah, and, and so, so let's say I believe a lot of things, right? And the thing that I would like to think is that if someone confronts me with the idea that my beliefs are false, that I'm eager to find out why they may be right. You follow me? So if I believe that um, um, take the laws, proposed laws against, aren't there these laws against sugar beverages or um, uh, the other kinds of prohib uh, prohibitive laws? There's a lot of enthusiasm for certain kinds of prohibitive laws. Foie gras. Isn't this foie gras abolished in some state? Well, yeah, yeah, there's some. Yeah, these are, these are, people love these kinds of laws. So, and I think they're interesting, and, uh, and I love prohibiting things. You know, it's very it's, it's terrific. <laughs> I like, you know. So, the question is, or even the more serious matter, the stop and frisk laws, for example, in New York. So, let's say I have a political point of view, or about Syria, whatever it is. I think the problem is not the education, but the unwillingness of people. That's why the internet is so successful. It reinforces a set of beliefs that seem to work, are very convenient, and allow people to pursue their private lives with thinking that they've solved the matter. And I don't really, and the only thing that inspires people to think differently is a real crisis. You know, take gun laws. Take environmental laws. So after Sandy, people worried very briefly. Their attention was focused on the fact that something might have to be changed about the way we consider how we deal with the planet in some way, or after the shooting uh, in Newtown. But the attention span for things in the public arena is very short. It's not the education. And the tragedy is the people with the most to gain from a conversation um, have been lulled into thinking that either the conversation isn't worthwhile or there's no need to engage it. I, I, I just wonder if capacity isn't uh, more the matter. Not native capacity, but culture is, uh, culture is a shared faith and it's a shared training. But the great thing about modern technology is if we used it differently, um, adults could continue to be educated. In other words, why should education be a system only for a certain time of the day? The great thing about education is that nobody seems to learn at night. <laughs> Why? Well, yesterday we Why had a reason. Why not sleep during the day and go to school at night? It would be a lot, would be a lot more efficient. We had a presentation from Andrew Eng yesterday, right. the founder of Coursera. Yes, I know him, yeah. So uh, what are your feelings about Coursera? Oh, I think there, it's great. I mean, it's, I think this stuff is all harmless. It'll, it'll, it'll essentially replace bad lectures. You know, it's wonderful. I mean, it's terrific. Some of these Coursera things are great. Um, and it will put a lot of bad state university teaching out of business. And the sooner that happens, the better. And it'll, may, it'll wake the, some of the elite institutions that allow their senior faculty to lecture to students. It happens at Princeton, Harvard, and Yale. And um, it's, it's a scandal. And Coursera is going to put them out of business. Um, and that's good. I'm not worried about it because it's, they're like books. A Coursera course is like a book. It's like something you have in a library. How to use it is not so simple. In other words, it, it, it's, they're very well constructed. Some of them are very, very good. Um, 
And uh, I, I'm, an, I'm an enthusiast. The, what, what's wrong is what people think it will do. People think that it will replace the university. Well, you know, the trouble is that I'm always amused by these claims because the university, I'm not a historian of this, but I think the university has been around since, let's say, the 11th, 8th century. So let's take Oxford from the 12th century, 13th century. It's long enough, right? Okay. So let's think of all the technological innovations, the university, as we recognize it, which is people sitting in a room together, multi-generationally learning with their same generation and learning from a professoriate in a conversation. What we would recognize as a university has survived. Movable type. The book. Every technological innovation, the steam engine, the automobile, the railroad, the phonograph, the moving image, photography. So it'll survive the internet too. It'll survive Coursera too. Um, I, I, there is something, I make the analogy, I'm not where I think those things are great. I, I, I make the, I've done it before and I apologize for repeating myself, but Teaching, the act of teaching and learning, is human and has not changed its character in recorded history. So it's not in danger, it's only enhanced by technology. And using our technology, let's open this up to questions from the internet and from the room. All right. Uh, is there one mic or two? Are there two? There's a, there's a mic at the top. Yes, could you? Point out someone. <laughs> We have a question down here in the front. The gentleman here, yeah. Hi, Michael Shank from Simons Rock. Um, my question is sort of about me trying to reconcile two things, that, two points that you made, Leon, that I think are sort of antithetical. You talk about um, American democratic education, civic education, as sort of teaching tolerance, a purpose being... Like to, teaching... Di teaching tolerance, like... Oh, yeah uniting diverse peoples into like one polity when you talk about like the Irish and the Italians and then later you go on to say that democratic education needs to be about putting aside your personal narrative and getting it for get, moving past the I to foster the we and I find that sort of hard to stomach because it's like how, el how else can this, can one come to know the other besides the sharing of personal narratives? How can you see yourself it's in the other without sharing of empathy? It's a very, I think it's very ironic good. that you make reference to Barack Obama's speech on race, a sort of a, the emergence of truth into politics, when that very speech was grounded in story, personal anecdotes of his experiences. Okay. It's a very, very good question, and it doesn't have a simple answer. It's a very good question. So let me answer it as, as best as I understand it, but I, my understanding is a little complete. It depends what you consider the, the, the personal narrative. I don't think for you and I to participate as citizens, I don't have to know anything about your private life. I don't have to know anything about your religious beliefs. I have nothing about your personal behavior, your tastes, or anything because we are really concerned about working together about a problem. We may be on different sides of the issue, but the issue may be zoning, the issue may be foreign policy, the issue may be a law about the environment. I need not to dine in your home, I don't need to go to the same church, I need to know nothing about you. I don't have to be the same color skin or anything. So there are a wide variety of public issues that fall into that category about whether or not we should um, change our energy policy, you know, things like that. Um, then there are a variety of public issues where the personal and the, um, the personal and the, and the private come closer. Not all political issues are the same character. Um, so let's take gay marriage, for example, an interesting question. So, I'm not sure that one's position on gay marriage is related to one's personal behavior. In other words, I'm not presuming that all people who are homosexual are in favor of gay marriage, or all people heterosexual um, are homophobic. I mean, I think the, these personal experiences don't necessarily correspond to a political point of view. I'm opposed to the state being in the marriage business altogether. I'm opposed to all marriage as a state function. 
I don't think the state should be in the marriage business, so everybody's treated equally. You follow me? So I don't know why the state is involved in, in, you know, in, in some kind of certifying the creation. I don't know what, what, what for the licensing fee? I mean, I'm a libertarian on the question of marriage, so the solution of the, of the, of the, um, is to strike down all marriages as unconstitutional. <laughs> um, but, but given the current system, I'm in favor of gay marriage because I think it's discriminatory. So if you're going to have marriage, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that that's the right thing to do. But as I do, I, you don't have to, I don't have to know anything about you. Or, now, the race issue you put your finger in America, particularly because of the centrality of race. Um, but let's take anti-Semitism as a European issue. Is my personal experience or that of my parents as a Jew in Europe important to know in taking a political position on anti-Semitism as, um, as, as a public reality or for the Roma now in, in, in Europe? I don't think so. So I don't think, that's exactly the point, I think there are things that I care deeply about that I would spend time with you, knowing nothing about you about, because we are shared, we occupy shared space as citizens, and that I have a great respect for privacy and intimacy. One of the things I fear about the current circumstance is the obliteration of any kind of distinction between that which is intimate and private. I don't think we have any right, and I think we have done a disservice by consuming the press the more they can tell us about the private lives of politicians. I think that should be off limits. And um, so I, I don't agree. Um, race is, a, 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 you're right about the fact that the president was effective because he spoke from his personal experience. But I don't think um, that kind of differential discourse necessarily requires that person who has an experience of it. Um, uh, and um, so uh, I, I think there's a decision between the private and the public. I don't think, um, I care about a lot of things that I have no personal experience with and don't, are not part of a personal autobiographical narrative. Do, do, do you follow me? If you're going to speak, could you yeah. use the microphone? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. About how people don't like to change their minds about issues that they believe, and I think that hearing a, a struggle like through the lens of personal experience is a way to open your eyes to a reality that you would have never seen I, otherwise. I think that's a commonly held belief. I think it's wrong. I think, in fact, we have all the evidence that it doesn't do any good. I take a Rousseauistic view of it. You know, when people go to the theater and they see a theatrical production about oppression and they cry bitterly in sympathy, they walk out of the theater and do nothing. Uh, I, I don't share this. I actually think the confessional mode has run its course. Um, I'm just, I, can I continue on that? Sorry, I'm here. I'm Exma Michael. I'm also a student at Simon's Rock. And when you came and spoke to us on the subject of race and I think anti-Semitism in Kellogg last, last year? I, and last, last year, Leon, you came I, to I Simon's gave it to, Rock. I don't remember what it's about. But. And you, well, <laughs> to open the discussion, you gave your whole personal story about your uncle um, about growing up and now being that a is Jew. Not, now, that's, that's not fair. I was not in a political conversation. That's not fair. It's dishonest. It's okay. dishonest. And I will tell you quite frankly, it's because the issue that was brought up by a student that was not the subject of my talk, it was in the question and answer period. And people were concerned. I don't remember what the political issue was. There was a concern about racism and they're on campus. And there was a, a, a political issue at the time and I probably, um, and the nature of the question probably inspired me to, um, because I'm president of the college there, and it's a different kind of community mm -hmm. in which you are entitled as a student to know something about me personally. I'm not in the public arena completely. You follow me? I'm not okay, a politician. That makes sense. You did not vote for me. 
Okay. Uh, I was imposed on you, and therefore you have a right. You have a right to hear something of, because I'm in that sense a teacher. That's not a political discourse. Okay, that's and like... if you hold the fact that I finally made a point about prejudice, because the fact is that, um, and probably I made a mistake. And your comment, I make a point, I will never in the remaining of my career in any public forum see, speak about myself, my family, or my parents, except for their professional achievement. So what you've done is actually something which is quite cruel. When actually something that is personal, when there's something that is personal, something is personal, you think it's funny. I don't think it is funny. The fact is the personal is very sacred. And when people step out of the line, especially someone like myself, and speaks about that experience, right, which I'm the experience of, of persecution and extermination, and I speak about it, it's not easy. And therefore, I probably made a mistake, and I apologize for it. Thank you. And I apologize for bringing it up in this sphere. It's your privilege. That's what a public conversation is about. I learned something from it. And so from this public conversation, we move on to the next. We thank uh, President Botstein for his remarks, and you for yours.